125, Spring 2019. Woo! Behind me, I have my favorite group of people in the class, which are just a subset of this semester's course staff. So everyone up on the stage, as well as a bunch of people that couldn't make it this morning, they are here today because they want to help you learn computer science. A lot of these people went on the same journey last semester, and they are back to help you out because they understand what this means. They understand how important this is and how transformative it can be to learn these skills and to learn these concepts. So please give them a big round of applause. Um, you will benefit greatly from their experience, from their guidance, from their moral support. Uh, you will struggle in this class. There are times when you will get down and frustrated, and the people behind me on the stage are the best ones to talk to because they've been there, and they got through it, and they succeeded, uh, and they learned a lot last semester. Uh, if you're standing in the back, please come down and try to find a seat. Uh, this room is obviously going to be a little bit, bit of a challenge for us this semester. There, I've been told that there are 620 seats in this room, give or take. Um, there are 583 students enrolled in the class. If you get here early, please move to the middle of the row. Uh, some of you can actually do that right now. That would be great to help uh, create some space on the ends for people that arrive late. Um, but there, is, there are points for attendance for this class, and so you do need to be here. And so we are going to have to work together to make this work. OK, please come in, find a seat. Um, you guys, uh, actually, where are my TAs? Can the TAs step forward? I see one TA. I know there's more than one. Here's another one. Where are the TAs? I just want to point out our fantastic teaching assistants. There's one, two, three. Can you guys raise your hands? All right. Well, three of them are capable of following instructions. I'll work on the other six. Um, so, but again, all these people are here to help you. Um, you'll have more chances to meet them later this week. Thanks, guys, for showing up today. I really appreciate all your help. Um, and we'll look forward to a wonderful semester together. So give them another round of applause as they leave. Thank you very much, guys. You guys can go. I appreciate you being here. All right, so if you're in the audience today, you are in the right place. This is the thing to learn today. This is the most powerful skill. This is, will give you access to the most powerful set of tools uh, on Earth. Learning how to program, learning the tools of computer science will change your life. These people are so excited by that that they can't stop talking on their way out, which is awesome. Um, so this is the right place to be. I hope that all of you are here at the end of the semester, at the end of our journey together. That is my goal. My goal is to take all of you from today, when some of you don't know how to do this at all, till the end of the semester where you will be building really sophisticated things. And we do that one day at a time in this class. We'll talk more about that today. At their core, one of the things I want to remind you of, because this is something that will help you, throughout the class to keep in mind something important, which is that at their core, computers are only capable of doing very, very basic things. They are simple machines. Sometimes they will seem complicated or mysterious, but at their core, they're really only capable of doing a couple of things. Basic mathematics. So they can add, they can subtract, they can multiply. Um, they can make simple decisions based on data or based on inputs. They can choose to do one thing or to do another thing. They can do things over and over again extremely quickly. This is really what produces some of the more sort of transformative capabilities of computers. So some of you may have heard uh, that Google has now created a general um, artificial intelligence that can play games. It can learn how to play games. So it learned how to play Go, and then recently it taught itself how to play chess. And it's actually already at the point where it's starting to beat some of the best chess computers out there. How did it do this? It did this by playing lots of games against itself over and over and over again really, really quickly. So in the space of just a few hours, Google's game playing you know, artificial intelligence computer can play millions and millions of games of chess against itself. And every time it plays a game, it's learning. It's learning what strategies work and what strategies don't. So this means that it doesn't have to learn the same way a human does. A human has to look at what other people did and read books about various types of openings in chess so it learns how, you know, what are different good strategies. Uh, Google's computer starts with nothing. It starts with the rules of the game, and it builds up this intelligence as it goes. 
One of the things that's really exciting about this is both of these game playing computers have actually started to produce behavior that has started to shock and amaze people who are familiar with these games. So people who learned Go were actually really amazed by some of the moves that Google's Go playing computer was making. They said these are, these are moves that no human would ever make. They're beautiful, right? The computer is actually now teaching us how to play these games. But it's really because of this. It's because of the fact that computers can perform billions of instructions per second. And they, so they can repeat the same task extremely quickly multiple times. Computers can also store data. One of the things we'll talk a lot about this semester is how to use computers to process, store, and analyze data. This is one of the things they do for us, one of the things that makes them really exciting. And they can communicate with us. They can also communicate with each other in a variety of different ways. Um, obviously, the network of interconnected computers called the internet is probably the most transformative thing that computer scientists have built. It has changed our lives. It's continuing to change the world as more and more people come online. So let's see some examples of this. We're going to look at some code today. It's day one. So here's an example of a computer doing some basic math. I have two variables, x and y. I can add them together. Um, I can store the result in a separate variable on line 5. If this doesn't look familiar to you, that's OK. It will soon. Um, so I'm, I'm doing math, right? OK. You can probably do math. A computer can do it faster, uh, more accurately. What about simple decision making? So here's my example for today. Uh, I have a little piece of uh, computer code here that's trying to decide, based on a threshold, whether or not it's cold or just really cold. And you know what the boundaries are here uh, can vary, right? So the temperature outside today is what? 12 degrees? OK, so let's, uh, let's set our temperature to 12 degrees. OK, it's, it's only cold. Some of you probably think it's very cold outside. How many people think it's very cold? OK. Some of you have, have clearly been here for a few semesters. All right. Um, so, so otherwise, if the temperature is less than 20, let's print it's really cold. So for some of you, maybe it feels really cold. So here's an example of just simple computer-based decision making based on data. I have a piece of data, which is the temperature outside, and then I'm using it to make a simple decision about how to categorize or how to classify the temperature. Again, computers can do these things over and over and over extremely quickly. So here's a small piece of computer code. This piece of computer code is simply going to add one to a variable over and over again, but it's going to do this. I've even lost track of how many how large this number is. Let's see here. So it's going to do this 10 million times. OK, so I'm going to repeat this operation 10 million times. Um, how long do you guys think this will take to run? Less than a second? OK, let's, let's, let's run it, see what happens. Did you see it run? So less than a second is correct, but maybe not expressive enough. Way less than a second. So this, this piece of code just performed 10 million operations. Can't even see it run. Right? So again, this is one of the things about computers that makes them so powerful, and one of the reasons that you want to learn how to use them, how to program them, how to get them to do what you want. And computers can communicate. They communicate with us. Here's a simple example. All this, all this piece of code is doing is printing something to the console. When I run it, it prints hello world. I can also modify this code and have it print something else. This is a feature that you guys will use frequently when you are writing your own computer programs so that the computer will tell you what it's doing as it runs, usually because it's not doing what you want and you're trying to fix it. OK, so our basic computer capabilities. Now, here's what's important about these capabilities. And again, one of the reasons that learning how to program and learning the skills and the ideas and the ways of thinking of a computer scientist is going to change you forever. Most of these are things that you're not very good at, except for communicating. Maybe you're OK at communicating. Some of you are better at it than others. Um, but the first three things are things that, that humans are not good at. They're unpleasant. How many people have had to repeat some sort of really boring, onerous task over and over and over again before? I mean, everyone has had to do this, right? And it's like, you really have to pay attention because you have to get it right, but you're doing the same things over and over again. And it's like every time you do it, you've got to double check your work and stuff like that. 
That is something that a computer can do for you. And it will do it perfectly. It never gets tired. It never gets bored. It never makes mistakes, as long as you program it correctly. And it can do these sorts of tasks. So this is one of the, you know, the great hopes in the future of technology. You may have read about some of the disruption that may occur in the future because of how many jobs are going to be taken over by computers. But a lot of those jobs aren't very fun for humans to perform. And so maybe we'll be better off if we trained a computer to do some of these things, particularly when they're repetitive, rote sort of tasks. OK. And so working together with a computer, you can really solve any problem. Computers are by far the most powerful tool that computers that humans have ever built for general purpose problem solving. Nothing comes close. Nothing. So that's our goal this semester, is to teach you how to work with computers effectively, how to tell them what to do, how to program them, how to communicate with them so that they can do what you want. However, computer science as a discipline has really sort of two important components that we're going to be talking about together. So computer science has a deep conceptual component, which has to do with how computers solve problems and what the extent of computer capabilities are. So that's one thing that we're going to be talking about. And obviously, computer science is also an applied discipline. When I took this class almost 20 years ago at Harvard, the professor said something that I've never forgotten. He said, this is one of the only classes at Harvard that is going to teach you a skill. That's true. This class, and then like, if you take a, a language class, right, you might learn how to speak French, you might learn how to speak you know, Russian or whatever. I'm going to teach you how to program a computer. So there is an applied component of that. That is something that people tend to find very exciting. But I don't want you to lose track of the fact that there's also this deep conceptual grounding to computer science as an intellectual discipline. There's a lot of depth to this field. There's a lot of important, interesting, hard problems that computer scientists think about that eventually have to do with what computers can do, but can be very sort of high level and theoretical. So we're going to talk in this class about the concepts that are involved, right? So again, this, this is a fun, think about it as fundamental, the heart of problem solving, heart of algorithms, what types of problems can be solved in what types of ways, right? Then we'll also teach you how to program. We're going to teach you the craft of computer science. And again, this is something that you will enjoy, I hope, and is something that will open up an enormous amount of doors for you. Once you learn this stuff, the world changes. Your relationship to the world changes. I find it hard. You guys, I just asked how many people have to do these rote, boring tasks over and over again. When I have to do something like that, I immediately think, how can I make a computer do this for me? Because I know how to do that. And so a lot of times I'll say, now by the time I'm done, sometimes it takes me like 10 times longer to write the code to get the computer to do it than it would have taken me just to do it by hand. But then I never have to do it again. It's done. Next time I have to do that task, I just run my program and it's finished. So here are some of the concepts we'll, that will, con, will concern us this semester. So algorithms. This is, to me, the fundamental heart of computer science. Approaches to solving problems. We implement algorithms frequently in computer code, but algorithms themselves exist outside of an implementation. An algorithm is a set of steps that we use to solve a problem. We can implement those steps as a human. We can also program code in a variety of different languages to implement that algorithm, but the algorithm itself is not the code. The algorithm is a way of solving the problem. How do computers represent information? So in order for computers to uh, interact with the world around them, they need to be able to represent data in the world. They do that by representing it as a series of numbers, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Once we digitize data, computers can manipulate it. The process of doing that isn't particularly complicated. It depends on the data that we're using, but we'll talk about this a few times throughout the semester. Later in the semester, we'll talk about a specific problem-solving tactic called recursion, which has sort of deep mathematical roots and involves taking a larger problem and breaking it down into self-similar pieces until the problem gets so small that we can solve it easily, and then building up a larger solution by combining those pieces together. All right, so what about the craft? What about the doing? So it's the thinking part. What about the doing part of the class? 
We will teach you, there's really sort of roughly three large units in this class. For about the first month or the first third of the class, we're going to be talking about imperative programming. So we're going to talk about basic programming constructs and how to use them to write increasingly complex pieces of computer code. At some point around a third of the way in, we'll shift and we'll start talking about objects, which is a way of representing data and also combining data and algorithms together. This is a useful construct for working on medium to large software projects, and we'll introduce objects and we'll talk a little bit about how to use them. Software development is something that will concern us throughout this semester, right? Um, how to write good, clean um, code, right? This is something that you guys will be forced to do on every homework problem and also on our programming assignments, right? So this is a thread that will connect everything in the class. All this semester, we're trying something a little bit different, which is that all of the labs and all of the MPs for the course, all the programming components are going to be done in Android. We've used Android in the class in the past. We, we did a little bit of it at the very end last spring. We did more of it last fall. And I think this semester, we're just going to start with it in a couple of weeks for our first programming assignment. So you guys, along the way, will be learning how to write Android applications. This sounds frightening to you right now, particularly if you've never done this before. But I will show you in a few minutes some of the incredible things that students from the fall built, many of whom had little to no programming experience when they started the class. We will get you there as long as you come along for the ride. Here's the thing. Some of you may be worried, and some of you are being you know, required to take this class or whatever, and you're thinking, like, I've heard terrible things about programming. It's really boring. People do it in cubicles. Um, you know, like it's just this really tedious thing. I have to stare at a screen all day. Um, programming is fun. You know, don't, don't tell anyone that. Um, it just is. Uh, if, if you're doing boring programming, you're probably working on boring problems, right? Um, I think of programming as this ultimate right brain, left brain work, workout. So some of you may know that, you know, the left hemisphere of the brain is supposed to be more analytical. The right side is supposed to be more creative. When you are writing complex computer programs, both hemispheres of your brain are fully engaged. Why? The left hemisphere has to deal with the computer. The computer is by far the most analytical creature you will ever meet. Your code has to be perfectly precise in order to satisfy it. Computers don't do ambiguity. Computers don't do almost. If your code is just slightly wrong, it won't work. And so the left side of your brain is like, heavily involved with dealing with the fact that you are trying to communicate with this most analytical of creatures. The right side is thinking about the fact that when you write computer code, you're not just communicating with the computer. You're also communicating with people. Because people read your code, they use your code, they modify your code. And so the two sides of your brain are both, I mean, when you start out doing this, I want to warn you, it is mentally exhausting. This is one of the reasons why we encourage people to start early on, particularly on the programming assignments for this class. You can't sit down and do this for four, five, six hours at a stretch when you're just getting started. It's too mentally exhausting. It's too tiring because your entire brain is working hard. Um, once you get good at this, it might become your favorite thing to do. It's my favorite thing to do. It's one of the reasons why I love teaching this class. I do a lot of programming this semester to support the various pieces of the course that you guys will be using. Um, it's incredibly fun, and you're building things that have huge impact. You have the possibility, you can build things in this class that will change the world. And so, not only is it fun, but this is a combination of fun and incredibly high impact. I don't know of anything else out there that has this. This is unique. Now again, I'm a partisan here. I'm a computer scientist, that's what I care about, but I really don't feel like I would lose this debate to anybody else at this university. You know, math, okay, fine, right? Math is kind of important, I guess. Computers do it pretty well, right? But learning how to do this is by far the most important thing you will do this semester, right? And we treat this class that way. All right, and along the way, we're also going to point out, when we have time, some of the incredible things that computer scientists have built that you use on a regular basis. So maybe talk a little bit about the internet. We'll see what sort of topics we have available to us later in the semester. So that's what we're going to do this semester. Let me tell, talk a little bit about the, how the course works. My name is Jeff. I like to be called Jeff. I don't like to be called professor or anything. Um, 
well, I don't know. You could try some things like Professor Awesome, um, whatever, P Professor Handsome or something. I don't know. Um, typically, I don't like anything that starts with Professor. I really don't like being called Shallon. Just don't do that. Uh, I don't know why you guys do that with professors. I don't, I don't like it. I don't know why. Um, I like to be called Jeff. I'm, that, that's me. Um, this is the thing that I do here. This is the only thing that I focus on for night in, day in, day out. The work I do this semester is focused on this course. The work I do with the staff for the class is focused on this course. The work I do with graduate students here is focused on this course. This, is, this course gets 110% of my time and energy throughout the semester. So I'm not distracted by other things. I'm here because I love teaching this class, and I want to do it as well as I can. That's my goal. And I want as many of you as possible to learn this stuff because we need you. We need you to learn these skills. We need more people out there that know how to do this because there's lots of problems to solve in the world. This is a big class. There are, again, I think about almost 600 of you enrolled right now. Um, and so we've you know, designed the course to accommodate that. But keep in mind, there's 600 of you and there is one of me. Um, and so a lot of the things I do are done. Some things may seem odd to you. You may come up to me and ask a question. And you're expecting me to answer. That's like a normal professor thing to do, right? You know, you ask a question like, oh, what should I do about this? I'm supposed to answer. Sometimes what I might say is, please post your question on the forum, and I won't answer your question. Bad professor, right? I'll be professor unhelpful. Um, why am I doing that? Because there's 599 other students in the class, and the probability is high that at least one, if not 10 or 100, have the same question. And so if I answer you in person, nobody else gets to find out the answer. But if you post a question on the forum, I'll answer it there. I am always on the forum pretty much all semester. And then everybody else will be able to see the answer. So that's just one example. But we do a lot of things in this class to try to make it work at this scale. We've thought a lot about this. This is not a mistake. I have asked for the course to be big. I want to teach as many students as possible. Um, I enjoy it, but you have to work with us a little bit and just keep in mind that some of the things that we do may seem a little bit strange. But they're done so that we can optimize how effective the class is. And particularly given, you know, I have a lot of course staff. That works out really well. But at the end of the day, there's only one professor. All right. Uh, one of the things that we do is we have a really, really, I think, good website. There's a lot of information up here. Um, particularly right now, I would encourage you to go over the syllabus. The syllabus goes into great detail about almost everything you could possibly want to know about the class. A lot of times when you ask me a question, Either on the forum, over email, what I will send you is a link to the specific answer in the syllabus. Don't be offended. That's just my way of, of you know, handling that efficiently. Um, a lot of the, and also reminding you that a lot of your questions are answered on the syllabus. If there's something that's not up here, ask. I'll add it. Um, but uh, there are a lot of things here already. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over the syllabus today. I'll talk about a few things in terms of how the course is designed. But I consider the syllabus to be your responsibility. We have a quiz starting tomorrow that is going to be on the syllabus. It is in the CBTF. It gives you uh, practice at taking one of our quizzes. It is not hard. You have an infinite number of chances to answer every question. So hopefully, you should not get anything less than 100 on it. Um, but it is designed to help you know, encourage you to go over the syllabus. All right, so let me introduce you to some of the course staff. So, we have nine TAs this semester. The TAs will be teaching, uh, leading your lab section, and you'll also find them in office hours. At, at right now, we have 141 course assistants um, that are helping out this semester. 141. So that means that there's about one of them for four of you. It's pretty good. Um, the course assistants, you'll find some of them in labs, uh, but you'll primarily find them in the basement doing office hours. We have like something like six or seven course assistants assigned to pretty much every office hour of the semester. Our goal is when you come down to get help, which you will do, there will be people there willing to help you. Keep in mind that our course assistants, many of them took the class last semester. So they're fresh off learning this material. Some of it is fresh in their mind. But they're not all, they, they may take you a little while. They take them a little while to help you sometimes. That's something that they're still learning how to do. Um, 
but they, we have lots of them. They're incredibly enthusiastic. They're very helpful. They just did this. So they can also provide moral support. They can say, yeah, I know, remember, that was really frustrating or whatever. Um, but this, this is one of the most important resources that we put at your disposal in this class. I ask you to work hard this semester. Really hard. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, we've done some things to try to make that work out as well as possible. But one of the things that we do is we bring resources to bear. We bring resources to you. So I do a lot of work to try to manage this course staff. But these students are here to help you work hard and succeed in this class. All right. Um, let's keep going. So let me talk a little bit about how this class works. So we talked about what we're going to do. Let me talk about how CS125 works, because I want you to get a sense of how the course is designed. Okay. So roughly, there are two parts of the class. I, I think of the lectures, quizzes, and homework, where we're going to talk about core programming and computer science concepts. The labs and MPs this semester, like I mentioned before, are going to be entirely done in Android. So these are two really complementary skills that you need to know as a computer scientist. What we'll work on in lecture and the homework and the quizzes are solving small problems. You're going to have a small problem to solve every day from now until May. I really like the fact that that rhymes. I'm probably going to say it a lot this semester. Um, the labs and MPs are going to give you a chance to build really high impact pieces of code, but it's a very, very different beast. Uh, working with something mature like Android is uh, daunting, it's confusing, it's disorienting, there's a lot of existing code you have to understand, um, you're not going to understand every line initially, so that's a very different task. The labs and MPs are going to introduce you to that as well. So on one hand, the homework problems will be these very small, self-contained pieces of code that we need you to write to solve a very, very well-defined problem. The MPs are big, sprawling, complicated, you know, messy pieces of code, but also give you a chance to do something really high impact, build Android applications that billions of people around the world can run. All right, so lectures. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, right here. Um, we do programming examples in lecture, um, just like the ones that we started today with. So if you have a laptop, bring it with you to class. You do need some type of computer device in order to follow along with the slides and get participation credit for class. That is something that's required. If you can't do that for some reason, ideally it's something with a keyboard, an actual physical keyboard. If you have a phone, if your laptop breaks for a little while, you want to bring your phone or an iPad or something, that's also fine. If you don't have any type of computing device that you can use in lecture, please uh, contact us either on the forum. That's one of the few times you can send me an email and we'll figure out what to do. Okay. So there are five percentage points in this class for lecture participation. This is a part of the course that every semester there's a lot of moaning and complaining about. Um, it's not that complicated. You need to be here from 10 to 10.50. Can we turn that off? Interesting. Anyway, I'm glad we don't have to leave. Um, all right, so you, have, you get participation points for being here with your computerized device, ideally a laptop, following along with the slides. So what does that mean? That means that right now, if you want participation points, when you look down at your computer, this is what you see. And then when I move on to the next slide, this is what you see. Okay, it's, not, it's not that complicated. The uh, parameters of this system are very generous. This is not like a reaction time test. Um, you know, you have a lot of time to find the right slide, and we're very generous about what that means. But if you don't come to class, or if you come to class and fall asleep, or, you know, get on Instagram for half an hour, you're not going to get point participation points. You also need to be here on time and stay till the end of the hour. Okay? I don't, like, I don't come in five minutes late, um, and I don't finish five minutes early. I want you guys to get your money's worth. I'm going to start on the hour. I'm going to finish roughly at 50 after, sometimes 51, sometimes 49. Um, and we pretty much do content the entire time. So please plan on being here on time, seated with your laptop, and following along until we're done. All right. Is that, is that what that last thing said? Yeah. I'll play some music before we get started. Uh, hopefully nobody will complain about that. 
Uh, we'll find out. I mean, people up there are complaining. You guys, I'm sure, won't complain because I have awesome taste in music. Um, so I'm going to start, again, I'm going to start at 10. We're going to go to 10.50. Um, you're expected to be here. It probably will take us a few days to figure out how to get in and out of here. But let's just do our best. Like I said, please get to the middle of the aisles. That's my next slide, actually. So this is an awesome theater. It's a beautiful place to be together, but there's a lot of us and just almost the same number of people at seats. So please, you know, get here. Try to be here on time. If you're the first person in the row, move all the way into the center so other people can get in and get seated. Um, again, people do need to be here to get credit. If you are not enrolled in the class, uh, please, you know, let everybody else get seated before you find a seat. There shouldn't be too many of you. All right, I think I just said all these things. Oh, right. I, I don't think there are laptop chargers here. I very much doubt that. Um, so please bring your laptop ready to go fully charged. It's 10 a.m., so that's not that big of a... Um. There are seven access points in this building. If, the, if your Wi-Fi goes out during lecture, you may not receive participation credit for that day's um, lecture. So please be aware of that. Um, please also, like, this is not the right place to watch a soccer game or whatever. Um, you know, anything that, I, I think there's plenty of Wi-Fi in here. I did look around and I did test this a little bit. Um, if this becomes an issue, we'll, we'll address it later in the semester. But please don't do like random high bandwidth stuff uh, in here during class. Okay, so lecture homework quizzes. There are homework problems every day in this class from now until May. For the first couple weeks, there are also gonna be homework problems on Saturdays and Sundays. The reason is simple. You learn how to program by practicing, period. That's all that works. That's the only way to do it. So we're gonna give you a little bit of practice every day. Some of those problems will take two minutes. Some of them will take 20 minutes. Sometimes you're gonna get stuck and it might take you an hour. You can drop a certain number of these, check the syllabus about that, um, but this is a primary way that we teach the class. The homework problems are heavily synchronized with what we do in lecture. That's part of my goal. Sometimes the homework problem will be about what we just talked about in lecture. Sometimes it'll be about what we're going to talk about tomorrow. But there's a really, really tight coupling between the homework and what we do in lecture. There's also a connection between the homework and the quizzes, which I'll point out in a minute. All right, one per day from now until May. You are free to ask staff for help on the form about the homework, but please try to do these on your own. That's our goal. And I'll tell you why in a sec. Okay. So we have 15 quizzes from now until May, starting this week. Um, 12 of those are quizzes, three of them are midterms. The only difference between the quizzes and the midterms is that the midterms will be more cumulative. The quizzes will cover stuff from that week. The midterms also cannot be dropped. Well, I think you can drop like two quizzes this semester. All right, I just said this. Um, so here's the thing. When you're doing the homework problems, keep this in mind. The homework problems are extremely similar to what you're gonna see on the quiz. Every quiz, including the quiz that runs this week, contains programming problems. The programming problem on this week's quiz is really easy. Don't freak out about it. Um, but every single quiz contains several programming problems for you to solve. Those programming problems are extremely similar to the homework problems that you did the week before. So if you do the homework, and you do the homework yourself and you figure things out, you will be well prepared for the quiz. The whole, so, so let me just reiterate this. The whole point of these quizzes is to get you to do the homework. That's it. The point of the quiz is to get you to do the homework. Not to scare you, punish you by sending you down to the CBTF where it smells funny and every computer has sticky keys and stuff like that. Um, we do this to get you to do the homework. So I'm, I'm establishing this link now. The best way to prepare for the quizzes, do the homework. After, we, um, after every daily homework problem is finished, we put it onto a practice problem set that you can use to prepare for the quiz. You don't get credit for doing those, but it's a good way to practice. Okay, more practice. Labs and MPs. So this semester, we're gonna do Android on the labs and MPs. So this is another enormous focus in this class and a primary way that you guys are gonna learn the material this semester. Um, the MPs are hard. They're designed to be difficult. Start them early, get help as needed. Remember, we have 141 course assistants. We have office hours pretty much continuously, Thursday, Friday, 
half day, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we'll have some residential office hours because we have labs that day, and then um, Thursday again. So we have lots and lots of office hours. There's a lot of chance for you to get help with these. But the best way to succeed on the MPs, start early, work on them in office hours, um, don't leave them to the last minute. All right. One of the, so, so again, let's go back to how this class is designed. I think that the way you learn this material is by consistent, regular practice. Programming is a skill. It's like running or playing the violin or you know, learning a particular computer game or whatever. You have to do it every day. You can't cram just before an exam. You need to do this every single day. You know, Yo-Yo Ma doesn't be like, oh, well, I don't need to practice for a few months. I don't have a concert until, you know, May. You know, people don't do that. People who are good at things do them every single day, a little bit every day. So there are no high percentage exams in this class. The largest percentage single assessment you're going to do are the quizzes. The quizzes are each worth 2% of your grade over an hour. That's it. There is no final worth 30% or 40%. I think that's insane. Because what does that force you to do? You cram before the exam, and then you forget everything a week later. No, we don't do that. Um, small bits every single day. Every day in this class, you will earn points. And we want you to be active in the class every single day, but it's a small amount. So there's no, you know, again, no big midterm to be afraid of, no big exam to be afraid of. Um, that is by design. Now, here's the good news. No cramming. No freaking out about some really high-stakes assessment. Here's the bad news. There's no way to like peace out for a month and then save yourself by cramming for an exam. If you peace out for a month in this class, you will be done. Like you'll wake up and you'll be like, what is going on? You know, I've never even, I have no idea what we're doing. You have to keep up. That's the way that people, um, you know, people fail in this course is they get behind. So again, you have to set aside time every single day to do this stuff. That's how this is going to work. If you do that, you will succeed. I promise that. But you have to do it every day. OK. So again, don't get behind. That's the way that people fail in this class. Right? Either drop or eventually fail at the end of the semester they get behind. We do a little bit every day. No big high stakes assessments. Just a smooth upward curve to the right, which kind of looks like this. This is kind of the goal. This is what we want you to do. A little bit every day, you get a little bit better. This is also kind of the, how the assessments in the class are designed. You earn a little bit of points every single day from now until May 1st. So that little bit adds up. Let me give you some numbers from last semester. These are fun. So last semester, we did seven MPs. We're only going to do six this semester. Um, the students in the class uh, submitted 34,000 commits. Um, they, are, they ran the auto grader that's attached 80,000 times. Um, they failed. So, so again, if you don't succeed, try, try again. They failed 400,000 times. Those were the number of tests that they failed in order to succeed on the MPs. Let me point out that the median score on the MPs last semester was like 100. Okay? So people did finish them, but there's a lot of failure along the way. So get used to this. To complete these, they wrote about 700,000 lines of code. There were about 800 students in the class last semester. Um, we estimated that they spent collectively about 13,000 hours working on the first couple of MPs. But here's what I really like. It's a homework problem from last semester. So again, we're going to do a little bit every day, but this adds up. We did 108 homework and exam programming problems last semester in 15 weeks. I wrote about 9,000 lines of code to test that. Together, the class put in about 26,000 hours of practice. This is aggregate, not per person. Just make sure you understand that, right? Um, yeah, I'm not even sure that's that many hours in the semester, right? Um, including 9,000 hours work practicing for the quizzes, working on the ungraded programming uh, problems that are designed to help you practice. They generated over a million submissions which contained 12 million lines of code. This is how you learn this. One line of code at a time, one day at a time, one minute at a time, but consistently, daily from now until May. This is how we do this. Here's where we got to by the end of the semester. Okay, so that's all the work. 
But what's the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? You guys can check this out on your own. Um, the students in the class built hundreds of incredibly cool Android applications. Some of the winners from our competition were totally mind-boggling. Uh, the, this group built a game uh, for playing Capture the Tag, where you can put NFC tags around and, and play with your friends. Um, so I, I will direct you to this site. It's linked off of the course website, and you can browse all the incredibly cool stuff that, that people did. Um, but you know, a lot of these projects were done also by groups of students who were beginners when they started the class. OK. How many people in here consider themselves a beginner in this, in this course? OK, welcome. Our job is to help you succeed. If you keep up and you do the work, you will succeed. By the end of the semester, you will know a lot more than you do now. How many people have some experience? That's also OK. OK, your job is to help the beginners and to make sure that everybody in this class gets something out of it. Your job is also to help remind them that the way you learned what you know is through practice. This happens a lot in this class um, where you know, some of you who are beginners are going to meet someone in your lab. And you're going to be like, wow, this person knows a lot. I must just not be good at this. That's what people tend to conclude. It's wrong. If someone around you knows more than you do, there's either one of two things that's true. Either they're faking it, that happens, um, or more likely they've had more practice than you've had. What's the way to catch up? Get more practice. Yeah. So don't be intimidated by people around you. And again, if you have some experience in this class, you can contribute to the course in these beautiful ways. Every semester this happens, and I'm wondering who out there, there may be multiple of you, is going to be the person this semester. Every semester, somebody who has some background that's taking the class chooses to be active on the forum and to help other students. And that is always one of my favorite students in the class. I could tell you who it was last semester. I don't want to embarrass him. Um, but people were like, is he, is he core staff? And you're like, no, he's a student. Right? So if you have some background, please be active on the forum, help other people around you, be encouraging, be friendly. Okay? That's what we ask from you that have a little bit of experience. If you're a beginner, keep practicing. You will get there. All right. So how do you succeed in this class? It's a tough course. This is not an easy class. Again, I have done as much as possible to smooth out the workload for you. But you have to keep up. So that's the biggest thing. Go to your labs and your lecture. Do the homework every single day. Do the homework problems. Start the MPs early. And particularly if you're a beginner, put on your calendar that you're going to be in office hours for at least four hours a week. You don't need a question to go to office hours. Go to office hours and work on the MP or the homework problem. That way, if you have a problem, you're in the right spot. Somebody will help you. Don't miss the weekly quizzes. They start tomorrow. Um, I will post instructions on the forum later about how to sign up for those if you haven't figured that out already. But we do have a quiz this week. It's easy. You don't want to miss this quiz. You will get 100 on it. And if you miss it, and then you can't drop, uh, you know, you, you're going to be angry with me because you're going to like, oh, I, I should have been able to drop another quiz. I should have been able to get 100 on the first one. But please sign up and get in the habit of doing this. We're, do we do this on the first week to get you practice at taking these CBTF quizzes? But this is an easy quiz. Don't miss it. All right. I'm not going to talk about this very long because it's not worth it. Um, we do check your submissions for plagiarism. Every semester, there's like, last semester, I think there were like 20 cases uh, where we needed to file fair violations. I don't enjoy this, but we do do it. And we are good at it, OK? I hate to say that. But I'm a computer scientist, and I've automated, you know, I've automated this to a high degree. Right? If we catch you, we will have a mountain of evidence, and you will have a fair violation on your record. So don't do it. It's never worth it. If you're stressed out, talk to me, talk to a core staff member. We're generous with extensions. We're happy to help you. The reason why I don't want students plagiarizing is you don't learn. That's the problem. It's not that you broke some rule. It's that I want you to learn as much as possible. And if you copy off somebody else, that doesn't happen. But we do take this seriously. We check for it. If we catch you, um, again, you will end up with a fair violation on your record, which is not something that you want. OK, so let's talk about this week. We're almost done. 
Uh, today, I'll be outside somewhere. I think there's like a little cafe in here or something that I'll kind of wander into. Uh, if you have questions or just want to say hi, uh, usually there's some things to attend to on the first day. To, to this afternoon, I will be down in Siebel 0403. So that's our basement room. That room belongs to this class. I'll be there from 1 to 4 p.m. If you want to stop by, if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you need help on today's homework problem, come down to office hours. The rest of the staff won't be down there. Normal office hours will start on Thursday, but I'll be there. All right, what else? So our first homework problem has been posted. It's not hard, but again, this is the first of many. So get in the habit of doing them. Tomorrow, we start labs and quizzes. Uh, please report to your assigned lab. If you're not registered for the course, go to any lab this week. Um, there'll be more homework tomorrow. On Wednesday, we'll be back here, and we'll start talking about how to program and basic comparative programming, and there'll be more homework. On Thursday, office hours will start for this semester, and there'll be more homework. You're detecting a pattern here. Friday, we're going to keep learning to program here together at 10 a.m., and, of course, there will be more homework. I've already posted all these homework problems. None of them are hard. Um, okay. I have... Let, let me just do two other quick things. There's an initial extra credit opportunity that's been posted if you take a survey about your background, and if you finish that in the next couple weeks. Two quick things. There's an honors section for this class called CS196. If you're interested in additional challenge and you want to learn some other material, their first class is tomorrow at 7 p.m. in Siebel 0216. Um, registration for that class isn't open yet, but if you want to find out more, go tomorrow to their first meeting. We also have an extra practice session for this class, and I will say more about this on, on Wednesday, because it's not until Thursday. If you are not enrolled in the class yet, Use this form to sign up to get temporary access to the course forum. All right, we're almost done. Take our survey. Homework is out today. I'll be around this afternoon and right now outside of uh, Lincoln if you have any questions. Otherwise, we'll see you in lab tomorrow or Wednesday, and I will see you all again on Wednesday here.